So our topic of discussion here is going to be pediatric asthma. Now, I talked about asthma in a previous section in uh, the internal medicine lectures under pulmonology, and that information, while it focused on the treatment for adults, the pathophysiology and the pharmacology of the medications that we use, it's all the same for pediatrics. Asthma has a tendency to develop during childhood. Uh, so you really can't talk about asthma without considering it to also be a, really a pediatric disease, too. We're going to focus here on the pediatric side of asthma, which the difference is going to be in how we go about managing it. There are some medications you can give to adults that you can't give to children. Um, so I want to focus our attention on that. But if you watch the asthma lecture in the internal medicine section, you will see that it's very similar and I do talk about some uh, some things I'm not going to go into here a little bit in, in a little bit greater detail. All right, so we're going to just brush over some of the uh, some of the basics, some of the pathophysiology and stuff, and then I'm going to focus more here on treatment in children. All right, so here's our vignette. We have a four-year-old boy presenting to the clinic with his mother complaining of persistent nighttime coughing over the past 10 days. There has been one episode of emesis, and his mom says that his temperature has been running around 99 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the past week. Mom denies knowing any sick contacts, but she is aware that, quote, the cold has been going around, unquote, at his preschool. There have been several episodes similar to this in the past, but this episode has been the worst. He was born via uncomplicated spontaneous vaginal delivery with an unremarkable neonatal course. He is fully immunized. His past medical history includes mild eczema since infancy, which has been successfully managed conservatively. He is tracking uh, around the 45th percentile, both for height and weight. His vital signs show a temperature of 100.1 degrees Fahrenheit, a heart rate 95, respiration 25, blood pressure 90 over 70, and he's satting at about 97% on room air, and he's in no apparent distress. On physical exam, you note mild erythema and edema of the lower eyelids, boggy nasal mucosa, and clear discharge. The remainder of the head, eye, ears, nose, throat is unremarkable. Chest is hyperresonant to percussion. Diffuse ronchi and wheezes are noted. No respiratory distress. Uh, heart is regular rhythm and no murmurs. Abdomen is soft, non-tender, non-distended, and he is grossly intact neurologically. All right, so if you want to pause it here and take a... Uh, a closer look at this, feel free to do so. All right, so uh, this child, uh, you can imagine, probably has asthma because that's the, what we're talking about here. Uh, however, there are some things that are going to point us towards asthma in this case uh, that uh, and, and point us away towards other possible things that can give you a child with ongoing lung issues, put it that way. So the chief complaint here is persistent nighttime coughing. Coughing at night is not unusual. Uh, there's maybe a viral respiratory tract infection or allergies or something like that. It's not unusual to have nighttime coughing. But to have nighttime coughing every night over the last 10 days, that is unusual. That points to some kind of significant process going on. What else do we know? Well, we know that the cold's been going around at his school, meaning that this may be infectious. Uh, but we also know that there have been several episodes uh, similar to this in the past. And that points us away towards this being strictly infectious. Now, that being said, this could be inf both infectious and asthma. And oftentimes that happens where a child who has asthma develops an upper respiratory tract infection like maybe bronchitis, viral bronchitis, and then goes on to have uh, exacerbation of their asthma symptoms. Uh, so that may be what's behind this. We also know that he has had mild eczema since infancy, and that is part of our, or this may be part of our atopic march. Remember the atopic march? You start out with some kind of allergic issue during infancy, typically it's eczema, and then the child gets older and then starts to develop allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, and then ultimately, uh, as they get close to, to preschool age, kindergarten age, they start to develop asthma. That's the atopic march. Remember, all of those uh, atopic disorders, they're highly associated with one another. 
So it's not uncommon, it actually really is much more common, to see a child with, uh, with one atopic disease also have another atopic disease, including asthma. His vital signs don't really give us much to work with here other than his temperature is elevated. It's not past the, the uh, fever threshold, which would be 100.4 degrees, but really no child normally runs around 100 normally. So this is high end of normal, which may be significant. On physical exam, you note that there is signs of clear allergy here, but it may also be related to a viral infection. So uh, the erythema and edema of the lower eyelids can point to chronic allergy. Uh, the boggy nasal mucosa can point to that as well. Clear discharge, this can just be uh, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, uh, but it's, it's really hard to know uh, just based on this alone. Uh, you look at the chest, listen to the chest, uh, you note hyperresonance, that's classic with asthma. So with asthma, there's a tendency to be overinflated, hyperinflated, and that's going to cause hyperresonance to percussion. The diffuse bronchi and wheezes, that can be part of viral bronchitis, but it can also be part of asthma as well. So you can see the two of these kind of go together once in a while. Like I said, you can have asthma. Uh, exacerbated by a viral infection. So what's our differential? Of course asthma. Acute viral bronchitis. Uh, this can be acute viral bronchitis alone can certainly manifest like this or it could be asthma superimposed on acute viral bronchitis or acute viral bronchitis superimposed on asthma. Same thing. How do we know that or how, how do we know that acute viral bronchitis is not at the top of our differential? It's, it's less likely than asthma. Typically, children don't get repeated several episodes of acute viral bronchitis. Maybe a few episodes throughout childhood, but this kid's four years old, and he's had several episodes similar to this with this persistent nighttime coughing. So just based on the fact that acute viral bronchitis does not happen that often, that points us more towards that this is an asthma going on. Also, the fact that he has eczema. Childhood eczema is an atopic disease, and uh, that's going to point us more towards another atopic disease being behind this. Pneumonia, theoretically a possibility. Some things that point us away from pneumonia is the fact that his temperature is um, technically in the normal range, uh, and he just doesn't appear that sick. Pneumonia, especially if it's bacterial pneumonia, they tend to run higher fevers. Typically, they'll be coughing stuff up. We don't know necessarily whether or not this is a productive cough, uh, so it's hard to say. Uh, but this is probably not pneumonia. Uh, reflux disease. So I brought this one up here because there's that episode of emesis. And reflux disease can cause, uh, if there is just a little bit of aspiration, it can cause that wheezing. Uh, and bronchial reactivity just because of the, the chemical effects of the, the, the aspirate. Uh, however, this is probably not reflux disease, and the reason why is you can easily explain that emesis from the constant coughing. So any child who's coughing constantly, they are liable to throw up. And it doesn't have anything to do with any kind of stomach bug or reflux. It's just because of coughing. It's just that happens in children very frequently. As a matter of fact, with, even with bronchitis, emesis is a common manifestation because of the coughing. Typically, when children present with GERD, there is the... Let me put it this way. The chief complaint is not coughing. The chief complaint is typically vomiting. Uh, or emesis. Uh, and a lot of times that can be so bad to where the child is failing to thrive uh, because they're throwing up so often. Uh, though also uh, in, in cases where the child's old enough to talk they can relate to you some pain that's consistent with heartburn. Uh, so if we go about treating this as asthma and it doesn't get better then reflux disease is a possibility. So how do we go about managing this patient? Well, we should get a chest x-ray just to rule out pneumonia for sure. Uh, 
Uh, chest x-ray can also point us towards some signs consistent with asthma, although they're very nonspecific, things like hyperinflation. Pulmonary function tests. This is kind of controversial. Pulmonary function tests are a best way to objectively diagnose asthma, but they're not necessary to do to make a clinical diagnosis. So you can diagnose somebody with asthma without ever doing pulmonary function tests. Personally, I think pulmonary function tests are something that is worth doing for anybody with asthma when you establish a diagnosis just to get a baseline because as we're going to talk about patients who have asthma over a long period of time, if they have severe asthma, they can actually get worse as far as with chronic inflammation, there can be airway remodeling and that can result in some non-reversible disease. So I think it's always good to get a baseline, but technically it's not required. If you do get pulmonary function tests, you're going to have a reduction in your FEV1, which is characteristic of an obstructive disease, which is going to reduce your FEV1 to FEC ratio. Asthma would be consistent with anything below 80%. And so in this child, we see 0.7 or 70%, uh, and that improves with uh, a bronchodilator. So we're going to talk about epidemiology and pathogenesis just very briefly because I talked about that in the other asthma section. We'll talk about the clinical manifestations and diagnosis, how we manage this. I want to spend most of our time talking about that and then complications and prognosis. Asthma affects 5 to 10 percent of Americans overall, uh, but children are going to be more likely to have asthma than adults. The way this usually works is that you develop asthma as a child, and as they get older, some of them, not all of them, but some of them will become asymptomatic as they get older and, and not require treatment. Now, that being said, you can develop asthma as an adult or as a teenager, and it tends to be females that develop it later on. Boys tend to develop it earlier on. Hispanics and black children are more often affected with asthma compared to white children. Why is that? Maybe genetics, but probably due to the fact that asthma is more likely to happen, it's more prevalent in urban areas. And we know that in the United States, Hispanics and Blacks are more likely to live in urban areas, whereas white children are more likely to live in rural areas or in the suburbs. In more than half of children, asthma will develop prior to five years, and typically that will be in boys. So a boy is much more likely to develop it early on compared to a girl who's more likely to develop it during adolescence. And so, as we see, Prior to puberty, boys outnumber girls 3 to 1, but during adolescence, the sex ratio equals out. So much more girls are being diagnosed later on during adolescence. As a matter of fact, women, adult women, are more likely to have uh, bronchial hyperreactivity compared to adult men. So this becomes much more common in, uh, in women as, as, or in females as time goes on. Just the economic side of this, among children aged 5 to 17 years, asthma accounts for a loss of 10 million school days per year and costs caretakers almost three quarters of a billion dollars due to work absences. So this is a significant public health issue. The pathogenesis behind asthma, this is just uh, acute inflammation of the airways, which can be precipitated by any of a number of factors. Generally, it is idiopathic. However, we do know in some patients, especially if they have allergies, a lot of times they will have a known trigger, or at least one of their many triggers is known. So, for instance, they know that being around oak trees can trigger their asthma. But it may very well be that there are other things that trigger their asthma. So it's very rarely one single thing alone, but in some patients you will have things that they do know triggers their asthma or makes them more likely to have an, an asthma attack. Uh, the direct cause, like I said, is idiopathic, but in many cases certain triggers can be identified. And generally those are gonna be environmental allergens. Airflow obstruction results from bronchoconstriction. This is manifested typically as difficulty on exhalation and is associated with wheezing. So difficulty on inhalation, that's going to be more things like croup and, uh, and 
uh, more things that are higher up in the respiratory tract. Uh, with asthma, it's a little bit more lower down, closer to the bronchioles and, and the, the smaller uh, respiratory tract. So uh, that tends to be more associated with wheezing. Uh, things like laryngomalacia and tracheomalacia, that, that can uh, give you more things like strider, which is on inhalation. Although really severe asthma, you can have biphasic wheezing. Unlike COPD, as you should know, the airflow obstruction from asthma is going to be at least partially reversible. The classic symptom of asthma is wheezing, but there are a lot of other things that asthma can cause. So as we saw in this patient, it can cause nighttime coughing, uh, coughing any time of the day, but particularly at night, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and a past medical history of upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, that may present as well like it did in this child. There are some variants of asthma that are good to be aware of. Patients with just regular old asthma can have these variants as well, but you can also have people who don't have just general asthma who may have uh, particularly this first one here, which is exercise-induced bronchospasm or exercise-induced asthma as it's commonly called. All this is is it's asthmatic symptoms that come on with exercise. And there are some people that don't have asthma that do develop asthmatic symptoms with exercise. And that's the only thing that triggers their asthmatic symptoms. Then there are people who do have asthma, just general asthma, but exercise is one of their triggers. So it, it can work kind of both ways. Exercise-induced asthma is uh, will come on with exercise, usually during exercise or maybe slightly after exercise really just depends on how long they're working out but typically it takes about 10 or 15 minutes for it to come on. Uh, how this is often described is cough and chest tightness. The cough is really going to be what predominates. So they start exercising they get about 10 minutes into the exercise and they, they start to cough. They'll often describe their chest as tight. When they try to breathe in, take a nice deep breath in, uh, they will uh, they'll start to cough. That breathing in is going to cause coughing, and that has to do with the hyperreactivity. Symptoms will be proportional to the intensity of the exercise. Generally, here we're not talking about things like weightlifting exercise. We're talking about aerobic exercise. And then another thing here with exercise-induced asthma is that it is usually worse in cold, dry air as opposed to warm, humid air. So if they're doing aerobic exercises like swimming, where they're more likely to be in a more humid environment, wetter environment, that's going to be less likely to trigger their asthma than if they were to run outside in the winter where it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That's going to be more likely to cause their asthma. Nocturnal asthma is uh, where you get the stereotypical manifestations of asthma uh, at night. And uh, wheezing may or may not be present, but generally the way this manifests is that you have wheezing that comes on during sleep, but it's not present during the day. And then another thing that's important to ascertain is the allergen triggers. So anytime you make an initial diagnosis of asthma, if, even if they're not being referred over to an asthma specialist, which in some cases they will be referred to an asthma specialist, but if, they're, if you're not then you should be the one to get a good allergy history, uh, which includes information regarding uh, whether or not they have this constant runny nose or if you ever use things like children's Claritin uh, to make some of these symptoms better, like watery eyes or runny nose, um, whether or not they've got eczema, uh, things like that. You also want to know information regarding their home environment, pets, seasonal allergies, and so forth. So I talk much more about allergies in other sections. You can go back and look at that if you want. Okay. On physical examination, it's going to vary substantially. And the reason is because you may have a child with just mild symptoms of asthma, uh, otherwise well-controlled or just very uh, mild asthma. You can also have a child who is in status uh, asthmaticus, in which case they could be uh, they could have respiratory compromise, they may be unconscious. Uh, so you, it's really it's going to vary. 
Uh, but for the most part, the common way for asthma to show up is wheezing, chest tightness, coughing. Uh, Well-managed asthma patients can manifest no symptoms, whereas some patients present in the ED, like I said, with respiratory arrest and problems like that. Remember, doing your physical exam, we already talked about this, but keep an eye out for findings associated with chronic allergies. Allergic shiners, denny lines, allergic crease, and so forth. Uh, so the manifestations by severity, uh, you don't have to memorize this, but just kind of keep an eye on here how this sort of, uh, you have these base symptoms and then they kind of get worse uh, as the asthma is, is worse. So with mild episodes, kind of like what we saw in this child, uh, you can have breathlessness after physical activity, but generally they're able to talk in sentences while lying down. Their respiratory rate might be a little bit increased. In this kid, we saw a respiratory rate of 25. That's on the very upper limit of normal for somebody his age. Uh, but generally, with mild episodes, it'll be upper limit of normal, if not a little bit, just modestly increased. Uh, you may note, you usually will note during mild episodes of asthma, some expiratory wheezing, docilitation, but they will not be using their accessory muscles of respiration, and their saturation should be in the normal range, meaning over 25 or over 95 on room air. Moderately severe episodes, these have all the manifestations of the mild episodes, like the wheezing and stuff, but in this case, there are uh, there is use of the accessory uh muscles of respiration. That should say A-M-O-R. I think I screwed this up here. Sorry. So accessory muscles of respiration. Uh, so if you note that accessory muscles of respiration are used, so you see things like sternal retraction, scalene muscle uh, contraction, things like that, then this instantly is a moderately severe episode at the very least. Uh, you, you may note that the wheezing is louder. Uh, these patients tend to prefer to sit upright, and they can develop pulsus paradoxus, which is an exaggerated drop in blood pressure on inspiration. Uh, the respirations and the heart rate will both be increased. The saturation tends to be low, but not that low, 91 to 95. It should still be in the 90s. They may be agitated. Severe episodes will have all of the manifestations of the moderately severe episodes, but the heart rate and respiration, uh, respiratory rate are going to be higher, and then the saturation is going to be lower. So saturation will usually run in the upper 80s. Uh, and then these patients will often assume the tripod position, uh, which is kind of where they're sitting down with their hands on the ground in front of them. And then there's imminent respiratory arrest. This is uh, what they often describe as respiratory fatigue, where they no longer have the energy to continue breathing. Uh, and so at that point, uh, they start to develop a respiratory acidosis, their saturation drops, uh, and they can start to develop uh, confusion, exhaustion. A lot of times, these patients will then lay down, they might fall asleep. Uh, and this is important to pick up on because there are signs of asthma that kind of go away when there's respiratory arrest. So if you're not breathing as much, you're not going to notice much wheezing. Your respiratory rate may drop. And so the respiratory rate, while it's very high in a severe episode, if they start to go into respiratory arrest, then their respiration rate is going to go back down. And that may, I mean, you should know if a child's in respiratory arrest just based on their saturation. That's kind of a giveaway but their respiratory rate may drop and go back into the normal range. Uh, and you might think, well, they're not in asthma anymore, but really they are. They're just in respiratory distress. Uh, diaphoresis can be present. Uh, you note the decreasing breath sounds and the pulses paradoxus. It tends to get worse with the severe episode, but then gets better, I guess, if you can say better, uh, with respiratory arrest. Okay, so this might help you uh, a little bit uh, more here. So you kind of graphically see how these symptoms get worse into the severe episodes. Then with the imminent respiratory arrest, uh, they these symptoms kind of start to vanish. So you note know that the uh, their appearance goes from normal to then where they prefer to be upright, but then with respiratory arrest, they may lay down. Uh, the respiratory rate and the heart rate, uh, the respiratory rate will go up as it gets worse, and then with respiratory arrest, it'll start to drop. The heart rate, however, should climb. 
Uh, the saturation is going to be what really will help you uh, with determining the severity because it's really, I mean, this is sort of the end result of whether or not you're getting enough oxygen is your saturation level. Uh, wheezing will get worse. Uh, the more severe it gets, of course, then uh, becoming absent with respiratory arrest. Uh, the accessory use of uh, respiratory muscles uh, is going to be worse with severe episodes, uh, but you're not going to note it as much with respiratory arrest because they become fatigued. Uh, pulsus paradoxus, this just corresponds to the drop in blood pressure with inspiration. It's worse with severe episodes. Uh, not quite as bad with the moderately severe episodes. It should be absent with mild uh, episodes. So with pulsus paradoxus, it's defined as being present anytime the drop is more than 10 millimeters of mercury. Okay. So for diagnosis, we already talked about this, about how you don't necessarily need to do pulmonary function tests, but I think it's a good idea just to get a baseline. So spirometry would be what you would do. You're going to be looking at the FEV1 and FVC numbers. The FEV1 should be decreased. The FVC is typically normal. However, if it's very severe asthma, it can be decreased as well. But what ultimately happens here is that your FEV1 to FVC ratio drops. All right, and then when you administer a bronchodilator like albuterol, the FEV1 should increase by at least 12%. That would be considered the uh, reversible obstructive lung disease. Now, in cases where you, you suspect asthma but the spirometry is normal, you can administer a methacholine challenge. So there's some children whose asthma is so minor that they really don't have any whatsoever stigmata of obstructive disease. Uh, and so you go and do the test on them when they're otherwise not in an asthma episode, and they're totally normal on spirometry. What you can do is test to see how reactive their airways are by giving them methacholine. And what we would expect to see is that they have an increased sensitivity to it because they have asthma, and asthma is bronchial hyperreactivity, and that includes hyperreactivity to methacholine. That's really beyond the scope of the test as far as knowing how much methacholine uh, they would need to be reactive to in order to diagnose them with asthma, but that's a way that we can uh, diagnose them on spirometry in cases where uh, the spirometry uh, was normal otherwise. Uh, so here is uh, our flow diagram a would be considered normal, so here we see the peak flow generally is, uh, when you're talking about a patient with mild asthma, is really not that different from uh, a normal child, but as the asthma, if, if, if the asthma is worse, then that peak flow starts to drop, uh, and it drops quite precipitously. What you do note on the, uh, on the flow diagram is that uh, on inspiration, uh, or sorry, on expiration, there is... Uh, this concavity, this sort of uh, dip in the uh, in the the rate here. So uh, note that with A, it's kind of a straight sort of a straight line here. Uh, with C and D and E, you kind of see this dip in the curve here, and that's characteristic of an asthmatic pattern. The inspiratory loop is is normal. The FEV1 is uh, measured as so, and uh, it's just the amount that you exhale in one second. And that's going to be reduced in asthma, and that's characteristic of any obstructive disease. The difference from COPD is that it's reversible with asthma. So you should go back to normal, or closer to normal, uh, with uh, the use of a bronchodilator. Uh, this is a reference for classifying the severity of asthma. This is going to be useful uh, when you do your initial workup of the patient to see how bad their asthma is right now and where should I start treatment. It's also going to be useful when the patient comes in for recheck and you want to see how well you're controlling it. So a patient with intermittent asthma is only going to require uh, an albuterol inhaler, uh, your rescue inhaler, short-acting bronchodilator. Patients, though, who have persistent asthma, which is defined as uh, having 
well, it can be defined as any of these. So if you have any of these uh, impairments, then you're considered to have uh, persistent asthma. So if it's if you have symptoms any more than two days a week, uh, if you have nocturnal symptoms any more than two times a month, if you require your inhaler any more than two days a week, uh, or if your uh, FEV1, FEC ratio is, uh, is less than uh, 80, then that's going to be considered persistent asthma. Uh, so a patient may show up with uh, some of these findings in the mild range and some in the intermittent range. Generally, the way you diagnose what they are, if it's intermittent or mild or mild or moderate, you go for where their worst symptom is. So if they're having symptoms daily, but they're not having, they're only having nocturnal symptoms maybe two times a month, they'd wind up in the moderate persistent range, but then with the nocturnal symptoms, they'd only be in the inter intermittent range. You're not gonna diagnose that patient with intermittent asthma. You're gonna be diagnosing them with moderate persistent asthma. Okay, so that's just an example. So the very basic principles of treatment, put very simply, short-acting bronchodilator, it's the fundamental basic treatment for all asthma. So any patient with asthma, you're giving them short-acting bronchodilator. That's like albuterol. The next step we usually go towards is a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid, and that dosage can increase uh, as needed. Uh, a long-acting bronchodilator would be our next step, and that's usually given in a formulation that's combined with an inhaled corticosteroid. And then if all else fails, we go to PO corticosteroids, and this is typically used for patients with status asthmaticus who need to go into the ED because of a severe asthma attack. But there are a minority of patients who require ongoing, uh, the ongoing use of corticosteroids. Corticosteroids have a lot of nasty side effects, particularly in children. It can cause growth stunting, and so we try to avoid this as much as possible. So like I said, all patients diagnosed with asthma get a short-acting beta agonist, which is a rescue inhaler. Uh, so that's, that's something that they take when they get their acute symptoms. Many patients will have a long-acting beta agonist uh, combined with an inhaled corticosteroid uh, with, for, for maintenance therapy. That's uh, roughly our step three, step four uh, of our step up therapy. Uh, that's where most patients tend to be. There are very there, there's a minority of patients who just have the the intermittent asthma, uh, but most patients tend to be in that that mild to moderate persistent asthma range. Adjunctive therapy can be used, especially in older patients more like over the age of four, particularly over the age of 12. Uh, but there are some adjuncts that you can use that are particularly useful in very young children. And so particularly here, when we're talking about children who are too young to really use that inhaler properly, uh, you can use oral medications, uh, things like Montelicast or Chromalin. Those are safe in young children. And you can use that as an adjunctive therapy for children who don't get really good delivery of the inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, there are certain drugs that are not used in very young children. So theophylline, we really just want to avoid in children overall, and really avoid with anybody overall. Uh, theophylline, you can get toxicity from it, and it's just not as safe a drug as some of these other ones. Uh, but we particularly want to avoid it in children. That being said, it has been used in children for asthma, but we're moving away from it. Salmeterol is never used in patients under the age of four. This is an inhaled critical, uh, this is a long-acting beta agonist. Uh, and then budesonide, which is an inhaled corticosteroid, is never used in patients under the age of 12 months. So we should consider short-term PO corticosteroids in patients with viral respiratory tract exacerbations. That tends to make the asthma worse. Usually you can uh, just give them four days of corticosteroids and that will improve their lung functions enough to get them through the, uh, the respiratory tract infection. The peak respiratory flow uh, should be measured because that's going to help them monitor their progress. Generally what you do is when they're healthy, when they're not having any asthmatic symptoms, you get them to do uh, blow into the uh, device, and then what you get from that is their peak respiratory flow. You write that down, and then anything 
80% or better uh, of that respiratory flow is considered good control. If it's between 60 and 80%, that's considered the yellow range, so maybe problematic. Anything below 60, they need to be seen ASAP. And then the patient should be reevaluated periodically. Uh, so, okay, so here's our sort of step up approach to treatment. Uh, so, the long acting, uh, or the, sorry, the inhaled corticosteroid, uh, when you start out using that, you may replace it with chromalin or montelicast, just depending on whether or not they uh, can really use that inhaled corticosteroid. And that's going to be really important, making sure that the patient is using their inhaler properly. Uh, they have proper technique, you, you need to, uh, to check for that because if, I've seen all sorts of ways that patients will inhale their inhaler and they're not doing it correctly. And if you're not doing it correctly, you may as well not be taking it. Uh, but in the very, very young children who have a really hard time with, uh, with the inhaled corticosteroids, you can sub in chromalin or mentelicast for the low-dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid. But it is the preferred way to go to give the low-dose inhaled corticosteroid, not the chromalin or mentelicast. You can also combine them, too. So this, is, this tends to be how we go. Like I said, short-acting beta agonist, then the inhaled corticosteroid, then the add-on the long-acting beta agonist, uh, then oral corticosteroids if you need to. Important thing here is that you never give the long-acting beta agonist alone. It's always in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid. Now, as the children get older, other treatment possibilities uh, begin to come into play. So you can start to give them things like nidocromil. You may be able to give them theophylline, but like I said, we kind of want to avoid that. There's some leukotriene receptor antagonists uh, that you can give them as well. Uh, so, but if, if you look, the preferred therapy is quite similar to what you have in younger children. This is really the basis of our therapy, but there are more alternatives as the patient gets older. And then this is patients over the age of 12, which would include adults. Uh, so the big difference here with, with older children and adults is that you can use, uh, this is it's known as xyloton. Uh, that is a, oh my gosh, it's a, I'm trying to remember, the, it's not, I think it's a lipoxygenase inhibitor. I can't remember exactly, but it, what it does is it, uh, it, it blocks one of those mediators of inflammation. Uh, yeah, that's xyloton. And then uh, amalizumab, you should consider in patients who otherwise have allergies, atopy, things like, uh, like, uh, rhinoconjunctivitis and eczema and stuff like that. Uh, this is not indicated in patients over or under the age of 12, so that's why uh, we only consider it in older patients. Uh, but you can consider amalizumab, uh, Zolaire, in, in those patients. But like I said, you can see that the, just the very basics of the therapy, starting out with the short-acting uh, beta agonist as the fundamental, all patients with asthma get that, and then building from there, starting with the low dose and held corticosteroid, gradually increasing the dose on that, and then adding on to that uh, the long acting bronchodilator. So, at the initial evaluation, what you want to do is a full allergy workup. If uh, you suspect that there is other atopy going on, you want to avoid any suspected triggers. You may want to refer them to an allergist. Educate the patient about proper use of inhaler. That's important. So there are oftentimes uh, asthma education specialists, uh, usually nurses who get a little extra training on that, that can come in and help the patient. Uh, they, off, they, they also make these sort of little dummy inhalers, which don't contain any medication, so they can actually practice using it. Uh, the peak flow meter, uh, I think is it yes okay so here's a peak flow meter uh, like I said what you want to do is get their peak flow while they're healthy uh, and then uh, so like their personal best and then you set this green yellow line here uh, to 80 percent of that so let's say they came in at 700 then 80 percent of that would be 560 so you would put it right here and that would be anything above that would be in the green range 
Anything below that would be in the yellow or red range. And then 60%, you start at 60% uh, with this yellow to red line. So anything below that is considered in the red range. Anything below 60 and 80% is in the yellow range, and anything above 80% is in the green range. The yellow range, generally, we tend uh, to tell patients to be aware uh, and to maybe check more frequently. Definitely have your, uh, your inhaler close by. Uh, this does not nece necessitate a trip to the ED. However, if they do go into the red range, they should be seen uh, soon. Also strongly consider a referral for baseline pulmonary function tests. Even though it's not necessary for diagnosis, it may be something to consider. What do you send them out with for treatment? If they do have just intermittent asthma, if it's just very mild and they don't have these ongoing symptoms, just an asthma attack every now and then, maybe once or twice a month at the most, then you can send them off with, uh, with albuterol, just albuterol, just a short-acting beta agonist. That's all they need. However, most patients will have persistent asthma where they're experiencing symptoms more than two times a week. Those patients, you will give them albuterol, uh, but you'll also give them uh, a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid, or if it's even worse, you may give jump right to uh, the inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonists combined. Uh, it just really depends on the severity. You also want to do a written asthma action plan. That is uh, some, very similar to uh, what you do for food allergies, where you put together this sort of piece of paper that tells doctor's name, emergency contact, what to do, uh, what the symptoms are, so that School officials, daycare providers, they can all be aware of how this is managed. And then you want to reevaluate them in two to six weeks to see how their treatment is going. At the checkup, the, when you're seeing them again, you want to know how often they're using the rescue inhaler, how often are their daytime symptoms, how often are their nighttime symptoms, and how's the quality of life, which is subjective. They do have these questionnaires that they can do. Uh, and you can sort of track their progress based on how high their point total is. But the reason you want to know these things is because this is going to help you uh, put their symptoms in that range of whether or not this is intermittent, if it's mild, moderate, or severe, uh, persistent asthma. Uh, a lot of it is going to be based on how often they're using the rescue inhaler and how often they're having symptoms. When do you want to change therapy? If there is no improvement in their present therapy, whatever step they're on, uh, after four to six weeks of being at that step, then you can consider a step up. If there's intolerable adverse effects, you can change the dose or the medications. Uh, and then if the asthma has been well controlled for three months or more, then you can consider a step down. But it really depends on the wishes of the patient. Some parents, you know, something works for their child, they don't want to go back because it's a problem, you know, to have your kid having asthma attacks again, going back to the ED. They'd rather just, you know, if it's working for them, it's working for them. They don't want to step down. Some parents, on the other hand, are concerned about the long-term effects of the medication. And so if the asthma has been well controlled for a while, they may consider stepping down. What I want you to get from this is that you may step down after three months, but you don't need to step down after three months and then reevaluate as necessary. Typically, the worse their asthma is, the more frequently you want to evaluate them, uh, and the more controlled it is, the less frequently you need to evaluate them. But all patients with asthma should be being, they should be seen on a regular basis for the asthma alone. Complications include a reduced quality of life um, that comes with having persistent symptoms of asthma. This is what we really want to avoid by managing their asthma. Really the management goals for asthma is to ameliorate and prevent symptoms. We want to make sure that they are able to have restful sleep uh, so that they can have normal growth development. We want to make sure that their quality of life is satisfactory, that they can participate in school and in uh, extracurricular activities. We want to minimize the frequency of their acute attacks, and we want to minimize the adverse effects of their medication. That's, those are all our goals. Uh, but it's inevitable that patients with the more severe asthma, they are going to have a reduced quality of life because it's difficult for, to control their asthma, and they're, they're going to miss school. They're going to be afraid to do um, things uh, like exercise, which might flare up their asthma. 
And so that is one of the complications. With long-term asthma, especially if you are not managing it properly, there can be airway remodeling, and that ultimately will lead to non-reversible symptoms. Status asthmaticus, of course, is the most feared complication of asthma. This is where you can go into a respiratory uh, depression and ultimately uh, death. And then the adverse effects from long-term use of medications, mostly what we're looking at here are the steroids. So high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and certainly systemic uh, oral corticosteroids, uh, they can cause growth impairment, decrease bone mineral density, skin thinning, bruising, and cataracts. Generally here, what we're talking about is the oral corticosteroids. High-dose inhaled corticosteroids can do it, but not to the same degree that the oral corticosteroids do. Prognosis, uh, it is guarded. Uh, even though these patients, they do tend to get better as they get older, the problem is patients who have asthma that are not coming in to be, get checked up they don't carry their inhaler on them, which they always should, just like patients with food allergies should always carry their EpiPen. Patients with asthma, especially if they're on the more severe end, they should always carry their rescue inhaler in their purse or in their pocket or something like that. Uh, the mortality rate from asthma in the U.S. is approximately 17 per million, and it is actually increasing, and that's probably due to the increased urbanization. We know that minorities are more likely to die from asthma than uh, than white. And that is correcting for the fact that they are more likely to be affected from asthma too. Uh, why that is probably has something to do with uh, they're less likely to be insured, uh, less likely to get ongoing regular quality health care. Um, so that's sort of a public health issue. Non-Hispanic blacks are the most likely to die from asthma, a rate double that of whites, and about one and a half times of Hispanics overall. Both, uh, I think they're referring to white Hispanics here. Prognosis is poorer in children who develop asthma under the age of three unless it's only associated with infections. So here we're talking about children under the age of three who just get asthma attacks even though they don't have an underlying bronchiolitis or acute bronchitis. Children who have mild asthma or better controlled asthma, they are more likely than other children uh, to become symptom-free as they get older. A lot of these cases, if they don't totally remit, they do get better with age. Um, so going into uh, late adolescence and adulthood. So they, a lot of patients can expect to get better, but it doesn't happen in all cases. Uh, the children that are more likely to get better are going to be the ones that have fewer symptoms. And that's all I have. So if you have any questions, go ahead and write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you in the next presentation.